Well, here we are in Wallace, Idaho. It's about uh, 15 miles right across the Montana border. It's an old mining town. Been here for a very long time. The entire city or town is registered as a National Historic Monument or Park or uh, National Historic. It is also known as the center of the universe for some strange reason, uh, they actually even have some signs here, right there. And it was declared the center of the universe, I believe, by the mayor of Wallace a few years ago. Um, just a little quirky town. And this is also where the movie Dante's Peak was filmed with the volcano. And that volcano was right back over there that was CGI'd in above that van. That's where the volcano was. And we're gonna go over here. Looks like we can go now. Okay, here we go. And they actually have the manhole cover. <laughs> the center of the universe. Right here in the middle of downtown Wallace, Idaho. So while we're here, we're also going to go do the uh, Sierra Silver Mine Tour. Going to go check that out and see how that goes. So we'll catch up with you, with you then. A few moments later. Well, here's our ride. We're going 100% total touristy on this. <laughs> I think it drives you through town and takes you up to the silver mine. It's supposed to take like about an hour and 15 minutes, I think, for the whole, the whole tour. So, let's get on in. Get going down the road. Oh, I'm glad Ron's not driving. That's why, that's why she's Yay! so Woo! Yeah. Woo! back there. Looks like these are the ones just came out of the mine. We're gonna swamp out, take them back while we go in. Yeah. All right, let's get unloaded. So actually, we're gonna go in there and we come out over here. Okay, so we're heading up here.
Mary Cage. Maybe I'll crank that up and drill in there. This machine is called a diamond core drill. It uses diamonds in the bit so it'll cut through any type of rock. Uh, the bit threads onto a series of tubes. Uh, they call them rods, but they're actually a tube. And uh, as it cuts through the rock, it creates a rock core. Now they can extract that core out, and uh, the engineers and geologists can examine these core samples and see exactly what's out in the rock. Uh, they'll drill quite a few holes at different angles to get a good overall picture. And each time they bring a sample out, they'll mark the depth of the hole. It's kind of like DNA for rock. Uh, this machine was capable of drilling about 1,000 feet out into the rock. Some of the newer diesel and electric hydraulic machines will drill miles out into the rock. Quite a bit bigger machine than this. Years ago, when the old prospectors were driving their drifts by hand, they'd be quite a bit smaller than this. One of the things that would happen to them, they'd get way back in there, uh, working really hard, and they'd use up all their oxygen. So they brought canaries in uh, and put them close to where they were working. And when the canaries stopped chirping, they knew they had to get out because they were running out of air. And sadly, the reason the canary stopped had already run out of air and sacrificed its life for the miners. The little canaries are very brave back in those days. But the miners couldn't always hear the canary, so they'd look over at that cage every so often. And if the canary was like this, they knew they were OK. They had a, a good air. But if the canary was like this, they knew they had to get out because they were out of air. So this was an air meter. No air, air. No air, air. Uh, and I can't promise you 100% that, that uh, they actually used that, but they could have, you know. Uh, but they, they used uh, canaries in coal mines for methane gas, and here they just use them for lack of oxygen. Uh, the other tour guides here, uh, I'm quite a bit older than the rest of them, they call me the fossil. And they're always messing around with me. They, they uh, talk to me like I'm a, like a thousand years old. And so, uh, one day they said, well, hey, Freddie, what was it like working with canaries? And my grandfather didn't even work with canaries, you know. Uh, of course, I can't tell you what I told them. Uh, and they said, hey, Freddie, what was it like when dirt came? And I definitely can't tell you what I told them then. Uh, but uh, that's, that's how it goes, you know, when you're, when you're that much older than they are. Uh, but um, we get along pretty good. But... Uh, before they got brought this machine here, this was one of the classrooms where the, they had the, the uh, uh, class for the, the uh, young people. Uh, and they were learning to run a machine called a jack leg. And uh, it drills holes straight into the rock. And this is a, that's a machine you use to drill and blast and create the drifts here that we go through and also to mine the aura. And up here you can see at the top, you'll see a couple places where the drill steel is sticking out. And that's what they call the miners, uh, the miners call that hum steel. And that's where they kind of hadn't quite got the hang of that machine yet, and they got those stuck in there so tight that now they're part of the environment. Uh, when I was learning to run that machine uh, years ago, uh, I was actually down where they were mining, uh, working with the miners, and they were teaching me how to run it. And I, I got a lot of uh, steel hum, uh, a lot of steel stuck up there, but uh, we, the miners helped me out, and, and I was able to blast it out so nobody ever knew how many steel I got hung, you know. Uh, uh, at least I didn't think they did, but when we mine uh, the ore in this uh, area here, we don't mine on the way down. We don't sink a shaft and mine on the way down. We go down and mine on the way back up. So we're always working above the track. Uh, higher up every uh, day. And so I heard the, the train down there. I climbed down one day and uh, there was a motorman. He was uh, loading all this uh, broken and bent steel into a car. He put his light on me and said, you. And I said, I'm sorry. I said, you won't tell anybody. He said, I won't tell anybody. Just stop doing it. And by the time we got to the service, everybody in the mine knew about it. So for about a week, everybody says, hey, Freddie, how many steel are you going to need today? You know, how many steel are you going to hang today? You know, and stuff like that. And so if they tell you they're not going to tell, that, that means they're going to tell for sure. You know? And uh, everybody will know by the time you get out. You know? uh, now, if we go down here, and uh, i got a whole bunch of stuff to talk to you about right down here.
Back there, I mentioned uh, uh, that, that the uh, rock fixers would keep their drifts uh, pretty low, pretty small. Uh, and they would actually do that unless the vein uh, started to develop into something they're going to start mining. They might enlarge it a little bit so they could work back in there. But another thing that would happen, as well as uh, uh, losing their oxygen, is that they'd come in here and they'd lose their light from outside. And it would kind of like, uh, look like this without any light. So they would come in and work by candlelight. Now these candle holders have very sharp spikes driving cracks in the rock or if they had a hole they had not blasted, they put a wedge in there and then they put a candle in there. They couldn't always get them right where they needed them or wanted them so they had to take whatever they could get. And so they would come in here and put the candles in there and start working by candlelight. I'll show you that, uh, how that would uh, be uh, if you had been around back in those days. Now, another thing that would happen is that quite often they would come in and work alone. Maybe their partner wouldn't show up, but there were guys that actually preferred to work alone. And instead of that big double jack, they would use its little cousin called a single jack. Now, if you had been around back in those days, uh, you could actually see this happen. I'll show you what you would uh, be looking at. And this guy would be back here turning his steel with one hand and hitting it with a single jack. And that's how he would drill his holes to blast. Uh, and then if his partner did show up, his partner would be out here with that great big double jack. Only with the candle not being able to get right where they want, he might not be able to see where to hit this. So this guy would put his thumb right here, and uh, then that would uh, reflect just enough light for him to see where to hit it with that big double jack. And just before he hits, this guy slips his thumb out of the way. Now, if he hadn't gotten to bed early enough the night before and wasn't as quick as he needed to be, why, one of the more popular nicknames that he would get was uh, Stubby. Uh, they had all names they would give him, but that was one of the more popular uh, names. And, of course, his stomach would be smashed flat, and we have written accounts that actually did happen, but we're pretty sure it never happened more than once to anybody, you know, <laughs> or they should have found something else to do. Between candlelight and electric lights, uh, a lot of devices that came out, uh, kerosene lamp, oil lamp, carbide. none were as effective uh, or as fascinating as the carbide lamp. These came out a little after 1900. This one was made in 1913. They put calcium carbide in the bottom tank and water in the top tank. And when calcium carbide gets wet, it gives off a flammable gas called uh, acetylene. They would put their hand over it, let the gas build up, and then they would light it. And I'll show you what that would be like. There we go. And that's what they were like. They actually put out a pretty decent light for what they were. Uh, one this size burning continually would burn about three and a half to four hours before they had to refill it. And when they first came out, they had hooks in the back to hang on cracks in the rock or on the timber, because miners didn't wear hats. When they started wearing hats, they adapted them to their hats, and they had great big ones they used for headlights for trains and cars and street lamps. They used them clear up in the 1930s. Kind of cool to see an old carbide lamp, isn't it? You see them in museums all over the place, but you hardly ever see uh, any that work. Uh, an old guy gave me one of these uh, many years ago, and I finally looked around until I finally got enough parts to make it actually work. Kind of cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All the years I worked in the mine, I, I wore a lead acid uh, battery uh, that weighed seven pounds about seven and a half pounds with the battery and the light, and now my LED and lithium ion battery weigh about uh, 12 and a half ounces, so quite a bit uh, different. I mentioned back there that when we mine the silver, we don't mine on the way down. Uh, we mine on the way up, and uh, that uh, we use a system called cut and fill stoke mining. Now, uh, what we'll do is when we locate an ore body and we're going to start mining it, we'll sink a shaft down. But we don't sink it right down in the ore body. We'll sink it out away from the ore body. We'll sink a shaft down. We'll uh, create a big head frame and put a hoist there. And we'll sink that shaft down about every 200 feet down that shaft. We'll drive a drift in, drive a tunnel in toward the ore body. When we get to the ore body, uh, where the ore body, we'll locate these veins and then we'll uh, drive a drift right into the vein and lay the track for the train there. And we'll go right through that vein and establish a working area on the other side called a tail drift. We'll come out, uh, we'll take these buzzies. These machines are called buzzies. They're designed to drill straight up. 
will come out where that silver vein is and drill and blast straight up into that silver vein about eight feet in diameter, and we'll put chutes in there to get the rock out and a man way to climb up and down. And we'll do this till they get about 20 feet above the track, and then we start mining that silver ore. That's where we use that jack leg, that machine that they were learning to use uh, there. There's one of them right there. And we'll drill and blast in that silver ore and scrape that ore into the chute. And the train pulls it out down below and hauls it out and dumps it into a chute at the shaft. And they hoist it up out of the mine. Now these stopes go back about, uh, that's what they call these, the stopes, where they're mining the ore. They'll go back about 200 feet or so and they'll get all that ore out of there. And when they get all the ore out, they'll pump sand and cement from the surface and fill that back up with sand and cement. Then they'll drill a blast and go up another eight feet and make a cut, and they'll continue eight feet at a time till we get 200 feet to the level up above, and they'll have this 200 foot level all mined out. Now down below them, on the same vein, uh, will be another crew coming up under them and on down and on down until it's not cost effective to mine anymore. When I first went to work at the Lucky Friday uh, in 1967, the bottom working level was 3,250 feet. Now they're mining down around 7,000 feet, and the shaft is, I think, uh, 9,700 feet. Now it's nice and cool right here, but the deeper you go in these mines, the warmer it gets, and, and the part actually gets hot down there. Uh, it starts getting warm about 4,000. I worked at a place on 5,600 that was about 100. Uh, about, I think it was about 108, and uh, 7,000 feet it was uh, between 130 and 160, and at 9,000 feet it was 170. So they developed a refrigerated uh, ventilation system to cool it off, and they managed to cool it down to about 100 degrees. And that's what it's like to work down that deep, and I think it's about 80% humidity from what I understand. So. Uh, that's how they're working down that deep. Now, uh, just for a reference point, uh, some of those guys down there are working over 6,000 feet below sea level, so they're down quite a ways. Uh, I've been down 5,600, but that was deep enough for me. Uh, this machine here, almost everybody is familiar with it, it's called a jackhammer. You hear those hammering uh, and in construction. That's the machine we use to drill and, uh, and blast straight down and create the shaft with. And that's the only thing I never did uh, in my career was working the shaft because it's, it's so wet I couldn't handle the water pouring on me all day. I don't mind it dripping, but uh, the water just pours on them. I had friends that worked their entire career in the shaft, but I, I couldn't do it. Uh, I didn't care how much they paid, but uh, that was the highest pay grade there. Of course, the contract mining doesn't matter what your pay grade is because you get paid by the foot. But, uh, uh, another thing we use those uh, buzzies for is if you look above your head, you'll see what has been taking the place of timber for many years now. Uh, timber is very expensive, it's difficult to put in, it rots, it doesn't last a long time, so they started using rock bolts, and these bolts can be up to eight feet uh, long, and they use heavy matting uh, and board, heli, uh, what they call holy boards. And where there's two different rock formations that come together, there's almost always some flaking, so I'll put this heavy fencing in there. And that's another thing they use those buzzings for, because they're, they're really good at that. Yeah. We're going down through here now, it gets really tight and low in places, and I'm going to show you how this machine real holes in the rock. pretty when you look at it, go up there and look down in there. The icicles are, are uh, what do you call those, stalactites, stalagmites, all the way from the roof to the, to the floor. Kind of pretty. There's a jack leg right there, set up and ready to run. Uh, has an air and water hose, and the drill steel has a, a water channel. The drill steel is eight feet long, and it has a water channel so that as it drills, it washes the hole out with water. 
years ago before they had the water channel, the old miners would drill dry and uh, the rock dust would get in their lungs and quite a few of them died as a result. So the water channel put an end to that. I think they've had the water channel at least uh, 70 years uh, by now. Uh, if you uh, look around behind you, uh, step out and look around behind you, you'll see a pattern of holes that is uh, drilled out and ready to be blasted. And this is pretty typical of what you would see in any uh, type of round in the mine, uh, whether they were driving the tunnels for the train or actually uh, getting the ore out. And these holes will be eight feet deep, and they take uh, electric primer and they put it in what they call a power primer, which is a very uh, special type of explosive, uh, very highly explosive, and push it all the way to the back. Then they'll pump in, uh, blow in with an air gun, uh, uh, material called ampho or prill, which is kind of a, a uh, uh, beaded uh, type uh, explosive, and they'll pack it in there all the way to the front, full eight feet of it. And they'll load all these holes and then they'll set the timing. Now each one of these primaries has a, a number, and that number signifies when that blast is going to go off uh, during the sequence. They won't all go at the same time, there's a very specific sequence. And the interesting part about this is it changes every time you blast. Uh, the pattern changes and the sequence changes every time you blast. So that's one of the most difficult parts to learning when you are learning to become a miner to, to get through. Uh, it takes a lot of studying and a lot of work to figure out how to do that uh, because it changes every time you do it. Uh, right now I'm going to show you how this machine drills those holes in the rock. And when I'm done we're going to blast that before we leave here. Uh, don't worry, I'll try and uh, remember to tell you when to run, but uh, <laughs> this machine's going to be very, very loud, so you want to cover your ears to show you how it works. Okay. I'd like to run that all day. A lot of these miners run that all day long. Um, when I was younger, I could drill a pattern like that in about four and a half hours, but uh, I worked in veins as wide as that. And if you're in a vein that wide, uh, even if you're really good and really efficient with that machine, you'll be drilling uh, at least all day for three days uh, to break out an area that big if you're in there by yourself. And most uh, miners are always working alone, so that's how long. It, that's how much you'd have to run that machine. Uh, as I said, you know, when I was younger, I could get this done in about four and a half hours. Uh, miners, uh, contract miners, never eat lunch. They might have a sip of coffee and then they go to work, and the only time they stop is after they're done. Uh, and when it, when they are ready to blast, they might stop and have a, a bite of a cookie or another cup of coffee, but they won't stop. Uh, during their shift, not until they get to the point where they're ready to blast, because that's when their shift is over. And that's where we are right here. We're ready to blast. So, uh, yeah. Uh, why did they change the pattern? Uh, it automatically changes. I mean, see, uh, you come up here, uh, when you've been mining long enough, you can look at this rock and you can say, well, okay, right here, this is okay for this. But once we blast, I might look at it the next thing, and I won't have those holes up there. I might have one hole there and another hole right there. Maybe I'll have another hole there, and I'll leave uh, some of these out. I'll just put about five holes right close there and eliminate those, but I'll put an extra hole here. Uh, it just depends on how you look at the rock. Now, see, that would blast different than this would here. This will even blast different there than it will here. Uh, and so once you blast different, then your sequence changes. The, the uh, sequence that you set the, the uh, holes off changes. And so it takes a while to learn to do that, you know, to be able to look at it and tell uh, where to put a hole to make it so that you get uh, break the most rock with the least amount of holes, you know. With the fissures and yeah. those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, it's different. Like, see where they might break, see. Now, uh, now you might, a guy might put a hole right here, uh, deeper here, and break more rock than with just these two holes here. But you would also have a hole up there. See, there is a hole that the, 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 the thing came out of it. But 
so we're ready to blast now, and I'm going to push this button, uh, and uh, you'll see the blast goes off. And you'll start from the inside and work out. And uh, this pattern in the center is called a burn. There's a, that series of holes goes off almost all together, about a millisecond apart, and it blows a great big hole in the center. Then the rest of this rock, uh, the rest of these holes blow into it, break into it, and then the bottom goes off last, and it'll lift this whole blast up and throw it right out here in front. And you come the next day, you can actually look in behind there. Uh, and it's very, there's a lot of engineering that goes into this to, to figure all this out. Uh, but once you figure it out, it, it's kind of cool because uh, it's amazing what you can do uh, once you realize how, this, how these explosives work. Now, if you use this much explosive outside, uh, the amount of explosives that it takes to break this out of here would blow the whole side of the mountain off outside where the, where the portal is. Uh, that's how powerful it is. Because uh, there's eight feet of explosives in each one of these holes, so uh, it's amazing. But in here, that's how much it breaks there. So it's a difference, big difference in uh, in what it takes to break this rock. So that's the end of our day. Uh, we're kind of backwards here. This is actually our afternoon down here is our morning. So we're gonna uh, go down and see what it looks like after we blast. It. When I first uh, went to work at mine, we were still using fuse primers. Uh, oh and that, that's, uh, it, it's uh, a little more exciting, uh, but it's not nearly as confusing, you know, because you don't have to, uh, the, you automatically figure out the sequence on the spitter cord, you know. mining, oh, let's say you're up there 70 feet above the track. Well, the first time I was with a guy and he blasted with this uh, this old primers, you know, with fuse primers and spitter cord. Uh, I watched him, he lit the spitter cord, and you'd be amazed how far you can get down 70 feet through that uh, timber. I mean, you can get down there really fast if you have to, you know. And uh, I got down there and he caught up to me, he just laughed and he said, where'd you go? I said, I wasn't going to be there. He said, well, it takes at least seven minutes for the, for the, uh, get to the primer. I said, you could have told me that, you know. <laughs> he said, you got to learn everything the hard way. So we blasted and we looked back in there and that would be, this would be our uh, silver ore here. This would be our vein. And uh, that would be full of silver ore. And so we're going to scrape that ore out into the chute here, and the train will pull it out down below. Now the chute's plugged up, but we don't care, we're still going to scrape some out there. We drilled a hole back in there a little deeper than the rest and put an eye bolt in, and put a big pulley in there like that one there, and put the cable in. Now we're ready to start scraping this out. Uh, this machine's going to make a little noise, it's not quite as harsh as that drill, but you still might want to cover yours. But watch that bucket here. This is how I got all this dirty this morning. I had to go back and fix that bucket. I had to crawl up uh, on the other side of that pile. Now here we go. Today, it would take me about three days to get enough out, but with this machine, I only need about an hour. I don't need to get it clean, I just need to uncover enough to take that drill back in and blast. And then when we get in about 200 feet, we'll clean this out and fill that up with sand and cement. We'll drill eight feet up here and blast this out and raise our machinery up. Keep doing the same thing till we get 200 feet above uh, to the level up above, and we'll be done here. And there's a crew coming right up under us, and we better be gone by the time they get here. We're going to have all kinds of problems. <laughs> Uh, in 21 years of mining, I only saw that happen once, and uh, all kinds of problems isn't really the word for it. It really is a mess. Uh, but I've only seen that happen once. Uh, when my daughters were younger, I told them they needed one of these to clean out their bedrooms, but they didn't think that was very funny. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have the same sense of humor I do. <laughs>
is the silver vein here. And this is where the sank the shaft. Now, the silver vein had a water seam in it, so they had to have pumps to pump the water out while they were working. And when they abandoned it, they took the pumps away, so the water just fills up to here and overflows outside. Uh, that water is 200 feet deep. It stays about 41 degrees all year round. Now when they sink a shaft, it has to have at least two compartments. Uh, it can have more, but it has to have at least two. It has to have a man ray to climb up and down, and it has to have a way to get the rock out after they blast, and also to hoist machinery up and down. And so they would go down there and they'd drill and blast, and then you hoist, uh, there would be a big, big hoist behind us. They would lower this bucket, the miners call it a skip. They would lower that down there and they'd load it with rock, and they'd hoist right above us and dump it onto a slide. And the rock would slide down and drop into an ore car, and they'd take it out and dump it outside. So all of this rock that came out from there, like uh, 400 feet south there, all came up uh, with that bucket. That's how they got it all out of there. Now, we're looking at the sewer vein from the side. This whole wall is the vein here, actually. And you can see the cork string is very clearly, but the silver is very difficult to see. Uh, it's almost non-existent. It's about half ounce to two ounce to the most uh, to the ton. Uh, and so it's really difficult to see. But there's a foolproof way of knowing when a silver vein is very low grade. You know what that is? It's still here. <laughs> I love doing that. <laughs> still here, and so we know it's not worth anything because it's still here. But oh, we're going to look straight down the center of this, and you're going to see this raw silver. And there's something that, even to this day, I'm still fascinated with it, is that you see these uh, cork stringers right here. And then you look straight down there, and you lose them. But I'll show you where they are. It's kind of interesting. Look at the purple. We'll come right down here. Now, see these cork stringers right here? I'll show you where they go. You can see where they are in Virginia. But here's where they are. See right there? Right there and right down there. That's what they are. But when you look at it straight on, they're all through there. Uh, but you don't see them that way uh, from the side. Uh, now, if you look up right here where my light is, you see that white quartz? Uh, and then you see the dark stuff below it and the dark stuff above it. The dark stuff is silver. Very low grade. Uh, when I first came here, I had my doubts because I was used to mining veins that were three or four hundred ounces, you know, eight hundred ounces at a ton. I had never even seen silver that low grade before, so I took some of it down to the assay office to make sure, and there is some silver in it, uh, but that's what it is. That's about a half ounce to two ounces at a ton, almost non existent. But if you saw that laying that to track, you wouldn't pick it up, would you? Too ugly, isn't it? I wouldn't pick it up. Yeah, it well, of course, uh, neither would anybody else. That's why it's still there. But uh, if you see raw silver, even even really high-grade silver, lay on the track. When I worked at Lucky Friday, it's one of the richest silver mines in the world. And the ore cars would come down, uh, train to pull the ore out, and they'd be rocking back and forth and, and spill ore over the side. Well, the silver is always associated with the galena, which is lead. You know. But galena is a crystalline, so it sparkles. And uh, the tourists, they would come down and they'd see this ore laying beside the track and they'd pick up a big sparkly stuff, you know, it's lead, Glen is, is lead. And so it's a solid lead and they'd put it in a pocket. She used to make bets to see how far they'd go down the track before they'd take it back out and throw it down. And they'd go down there and we'd watch them, pretty soon they'd take it and throw it down because it's lead, you know, it's heavy. And it was right beside a really high grade uh, chunk of uh, silver. So we always picked a little bit up and caught up with them, make sure they got out with a, with a uh, you know, a souvenir. But it was kind of funny because the silver, the galena isn't worth anything, but it's pretty. But the silver's ugly, but it's worth way more than the, than the galena. So we used to have fun with them that way, but uh, that's what it looks like. When we get outside, I'll show you some uh, high-grade silver, and you'll see probably the biggest difference that you'll see is the density. Uh, you'll be able to tell that right off. Did you guys see that back there? Uh, right up here, uh, down the track here, we're going to see uh, uh, a ray, the bottom of a raise. Did you guys see that? Okay. Uh, right up here, we're going to see that timber. That timber is the bottom of a raise. And they drove that raise up there, and they're mining this, uh, this uh, vein uh, from up above there. You'll see the mammary goes up, and you'll see the shoot where the rock is. They're trying to the rock out. 
And uh, what you're going to look at going by there is what you were seeing about the 1950s. Now we're just going to walk right past that and stop at this next machine up here. But this is what it would have been like in the 1950s. And anytime you see a sign that says key down shoots, I'm not going to run right past it. You don't want to spend any time under there. I actually got buried uh, by a, a, a rock coming down there and buried me uh, one day because they didn't put a sign up there and it, it, it came down toward the bottom of the shoot out. Very few? Yeah. For how long? Uh, well, I waited until I quit running and I uh, managed to take my... I was sitting in the motor, I, you know, running the motor. I was sitting in the motor and it buried the whole train and carried me about up to my waist. So, when it quit running, I managed to dig myself out, uh, went back down the machine. It was kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah. Kind of scary. I'm going to have you guys come right around here. Yeah. And then you guys can stay right there. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't want anybody right there. Yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. There. That's good. You're good there. I just don't want to get you. Know, sometimes I get water in the bucket and I don't want to splash anybody. Uh, now, we're, we're driving a cross cut. This is what we call a cross cut. We're coming on the main track. I'm going to put a switch in here and go in with this cross cut. And we're going to drive a, a cross cut in here. And we're going to start mining from this angle over here. So we'll drill and blast, and we'll put the track in for the train. We come back in and drill and blast again when we blast the mucklands on the track. And so we have to have a machine that will pick the muck up off the track in a hurry. Uh, we have to have it uh, get up in a real hurry, and that's what this machine does here. It's called a trap mucker. This is the most dangerous machine to operate underground. More guys have been hurt with this machine than any other machine in the mine. I'm going to demonstrate it for you. Uh, it's going to be incredibly loud. It's going to be kind of scary. You hear voices up there? Yeah. yeah. Somebody's going to jump right out of their shoes up there. <laughs> runs uh, three times faster than this if we had a bigger compressor. Uh, in the big mines uh, where they have bigger compressors, it's about three times faster than this. And uh, this is a one-ton car. Normally, we have about a three-ton car with the end cut open, so the bucket actually goes right down in. And if I actually had a load in there, it'd be a lot smoother. It ducks because it's, uh, the, the bucket's empty. Of course, I'm the only one that ever gets it off the track. I'm a little more enthusiastic than all the other guys are. <laughs> Uh, but I've seen guys get hurt on it. I never have gotten hurt. I was always very careful. Uh, but they're a wicked machine, especially three times thousand. Uh, and this is actually a lot of room to run in. I've, I've run one of these where uh, the, uh, the wall was uh, in about maybe uh, six inches there. And I had to get right in here like this. And the wall would be right about it. Uh, but uh, I always kind of got a kick out of running it. <laughs> They're scary, aren't they? It fills it very quick. Fills it. Oh yeah. Uh, it would, uh, this is a one-ton car, and I would have a two-ton car. Uh, when I was younger, if I had the rock in front of me, I could fill a three-ton car in about five minutes. With this. Uh, by the time the motorman brought me an empty car, I'd be sitting here waiting for him. You pull this one out of the way, and the other yeah, one's up there. Would, and... Yeah, he would pull this one here, and then bring me an empty one and hook on this one and go dump it. By the time he's back, I had, I'm sitting here waiting for him here with that other car. That's it's a uh, it's it's kind of fun actually. I, I think it always thought it was kind of fun. Uh, it's kind of exciting, but it is dangerous. You have to be really careful. You can't take your eye off anything. One one time I saw a guy get his hand mashed because he uh, I don't I don't ever turn the air off when I'm working. I leave the air on, and he came up and actually hit that looked over and hit that dump lever, and before he could move his hand, that rocker arm already had his hand mashed, you know. And another guy broke his foot. A lot of guys get hurt on it. They just don't pay attention, you know. you gotta, you got to keep your eye on it, and you got, can't take anything for granted. Right up here to our left is our original compressor. Look back to an antique. 
Uh, thousands of people have looked at it. So a few years ago, I gave an eyeball to it to look at that. And I just smile as we go by, and I've got one left stop. Oh, eyeballs. There's a little finger there. It's actually an antique. I thought it's only fair that it could look back. You know. You know, I, I said you, you have to have a sense of humor to work in your mind, uh, but uh, all these uh, other tour guides here, they say I don't have a sense of humor. They say what I am is insane. Uh, but I said, well, I'm a musician. What do you expect, you know? <laughs> I have a lot of fun with them. But... Now, we look out at the portal. You can, see a, you can see that skeleton there. Right where that skeleton is, I put that skeleton right exactly where the old prospector started years ago. And this sign is as far as they got in seven years by hand. Now, with the machinery I just showed you starting at the skeleton, we'd be here in about four and a half days. They never did make any money, but they kept seeing these quartz stringers, these little white quartz stringers, and that's what kept them inspired. Finally, after seven years, or whatever working here, uh, just dropped the tools and abandoned it. So that was the end of it. But, uh, there's a real low spot before we get out. Watch your heads, we'll go out and I'll show you some high grade ore. Back in there four years ago. <laughs> I told him to keep up. <laughs> on the whole tour, this is the hardest for me to get over. Just, just long for my stride. <laughs> what else? <laughs> now we're heading on back. Down the mountain, heading back into town. Bordello here, Wallace. And it shut down in the year of 1989. Well, about 35 years ago. That was uh, our adventure to Sierra Silver Mine Tour here in Wallace, Idaho, the center of the universe. And we'll see you on our next adventure. Say goodnight, Gracie. Goodnight, Gracie. Here's the end. That's all, folks.